Today we'll be covering how to create a cloth simulation and geometry nodes using Blender 3.6. Just like strings, the core of the cloth simulation are the distance and collision constraints. The distance constraint pushes neighboring particles towards or away from each other in order to maintain a predefined distance between neighbors, and the collision constraint moves colliding particles away from each other. The main differences between cloth and string simulation are that in cloth simulation, the particles are arranged in a grid rather than a line, and each particle has eight neighbors instead of two. The cloth grid is initialized by creating a grid of points and storing attributes on each point for the neighbor indices as well as the distance to each neighbor. Both of these attributes are needed in the distance constraint step within the simulation loop. The simulation is composed of a series of substeps which have four main stages. First, each particle is moved according to its velocity and a gravity force. Second, both collision and distance constraints are solved through a series of position correction iterations. Third, the velocity is updated based on the difference between the particle position before and after it changes according to the previous three steps. And fourth, particle positions are changed to account for collisions with the sphere and ground plane. This step comes after the velocity update because we directly manipulate the velocity to create more satisfying collisions and simulate friction with the obstacles. The project file for this tutorial is available through a link in the description if you'd like to follow along, and with that, let's get into it. Both the velocity and gravity force are scaled by a global variable named delta time. This value is used to control the speed of the simulation within a substep. The accuracy of the simulation can be improved by decreasing the delta time value and increasing the number of substeps. Accuracy improves because the smaller movements of the particles reduce the possibility of them moving through each other and each constraint runs again each substep, getting more iterations to converge on a solution. The initialization node group starts with a point diameter value and calculates the number of vertices needed for the grid mesh primitive node to output a grid with vertices spaced out by the point diameter value. It then creates this grid and converts it to points with the radius set to half the point diameter. Then the store neighbor indices and distances node group stores the neighbor indices and distances as attributes, and then we create an attribute called initial position for mapping text in the cloth material. Lastly, we use the transform geometry node to move the cloth from 000 to just above the sphere collider. In the store neighbor indices and distances node group, the grid spacing input value is used to determine the sample position for each neighbor. Each combined XYZ node takes a different combination of positive and negative grid spacing values to create an offset from the current point position that will land on each neighbor position. These neighbor offset vectors are piped into the store neighbor index node groups, which sample the grid at the neighbor position and store the index of the neighbor as an attribute. The attributes are named based on the signs of the elements of the neighbor offset vector. So the right neighbor index attribute is named 1, 0, the left is named negative 1, 0, the upper left is negative 1, 1, and so on. The name of the attribute for the distance to each neighbor is the neighbor index attribute name plus underscore dist. We get the value for the neighbor index attributes first through calculating the position of the neighbor by adding the current point position in the neighbor offset vector, and second, sampling the nearest index on the grid at that location. This will be our neighbor index attribute. Attribute value. The neighbor distance attribute is calculated by using the distance vector math node to get the distance between the neighbor position and the current particle position. Some of the grid points, such as the ones at the outer edges and corners, do not have eight neighbors. For these, we'd like to mark the non-existent neighbors in a special way to factor them out of the distance constraint calculations. We do this by checking to see if the neighbor exists or not, and if it does not, we set the neighbor index attribute to negative one rather than the closest sampled index. We test for the existence of the neighbor by comparing the neighbor position to the position sampled from the supposed neighbor index. If the distance between the neighbor position and the sampled position is zero, then the neighbor does exist. If the distance is larger than zero, then the offset brings us somewhere where there's no grid point and the neighbor does not exist. Moving on to the simulation loop, we have a series of substeps. Each substep stores the last position of each particle in an attribute for use at the end of the substep to calculate the new velocity, moves each particle by its velocity velocity vector, adds a downwards force for gravity, solves the distance and collision constraints, updates the velocity based on the difference between the current position and the last position that we stored at the beginning of the substep, and handles collisions with the sphere and ground colliders, directly augmenting the velocity attribute to simulate friction and create nicer collisions when the sphere moves. The store last position group simply stores the position of the particle as an attribute called last position. The move by velocity node group offsets the position of each particle by its velocity scaled by the delta time value. The add gravity node group offsets the particle positions by a small downwards force 
also scaled by delta time, and the constraint steps node group performs four distance constraints and one collision constraint. The distance constraint step works by getting correction vectors for each of the distance constraints between the current particle and its eight neighbors. These correction vectors are averaged to get the final correction vector, which is used to offset the position of the current particle. Averaging the correction vectors is done by adding them all to each other and then dividing by the number of existing neighbors. The correction vectors and neighbor existence values are obtained in the get distance constraint correction vector node group, which creates an offset vector that brings the current particle position towards the neighbor particle such that the distance between the two particles is equal to the neighbor particle distance attribute. If the neighbor index attribute equals negative one, the neighbor does not exist. The correction vector is scaled by this value so that if the neighbor does exist, the correction vector is left unchanged, and if it does not exist, it becomes zero and no longer affects the average correction vector. Jumping back out, we see how all the correction vectors are added up and the total number of existing neighbors is found by adding up all of the neighbor exists outputs. And then the correction vector sum is multiplied by one over the total number of existing neighbors to get the average correction vector. We then offset the current particle position by the average correction vector and we're done with this node group. The collision constraint uses the index of nearest node to get the index of the closest particle to the current particle, which is then sampled to get the position of that closest particle in order to get the distance between the current particle and the closest particle. If that distance is less than two times the particle radius, the particles intersect. And we create a correction vector that points from the nearest particle towards the current particle with a length of one half the intersection amount. The length multiplier for this step, in this case 0.5, can be changed depending on the simulation. The smaller the value, the less jitteriness is introduced by the collision constraint, but it takes more iterations to minimize intersections. In the update velocity node group, the last position of the particle is subtracted from the current position, and the resulting vector is scaled by one divided by the delta time before getting stored as the new velocity for the next sub step. We scale the velocity by one over delta time in this step in order to make the velocity independent of the delta time value. Since earlier in the simulation, we scale the velocity movement of each particle by delta time. If we just took the difference between the position and the last position to get the new velocity, it would have a smaller magnitude or length than it should. Dividing by delta time corrects for this. Both the sphere and ground collision node groups test whether or not a given particle overlaps with the obstacle, and if it does, sets the particle position such that there is no overlap. Each group also removes the part of the velocity vector that is parallel to the normal of the collider surface to produce clean collision interactions when the collider is moving, and then scales the resulting vector to slow it down to simulate friction. The sphere collision node group checks the distance between the particle and the sphere, and if it is less than the sphere radius plus the particle radius, the particle's position is pushed away from the sphere such that the distance is the sphere radius plus the particle radius. We've removed the part of the velocity vector that is parallel to the collider surface normal by projecting the velocity vector onto the normal vector and subtracting the projected vector from the velocity vector. This prevents jittery bounces that occur if the obstacle collision step comes before the velocity update step. Without this step, the particles that collide with the sphere end up with a velocity pointing outwards from the sphere surface, causing them to bounce around all weird like this. Then we scale the resulting vector to simulate friction. The ground collision node group checks to see if the z component of the particle is less than the particle radius, and if it is, sets the position of the particle so that the z component is equal to its radius. The same normal vector removal as we did for the sphere is done for the ground plane, but here the normal is always 0, 0, 001, so we project the velocity vector onto that. Here the value we use to simulate friction is 0 0.5 instead of 0 0.98 for the sphere, this is uh, so that the particles slow down a whole lot quicker because we want the ground plane to be very unslippery. Jumping out of the simulation loop, we set the material for our cloth, which uses the initial position attribute we set in the initialization step to drive the coordinates of a Voronoi texture node whose color output is transformed a bit to get the color input for a diffuse BSDF shader. The scene is lit with three sunlights. The environment and ground plane share a node group which creates these splotches of color that are projected onto the ground plane using the direction vector pointing from the camera to the surface of the ground plane. The saturation and value of the resulting color is tweaked in order to match the color between the ground plane and the background as much as possible given the lighting conditions, and then we mix the diffuse shader with a transparent shader based on the distance from the center of the scene to ensure a seamless transition. The reason for all of this is to maintain the background color on the ground plane while also retaining shadows. And that just about covers it. I mentioned in the end of the last video that I'd be covering cloth simulation and tearing, but I've decided to break these out into different videos. So stay tuned for another one covering a couple of extensions to the basic cloth sim. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you learned something. And above all,
I hope you had fun. Until next time.